Good evening and welcome to the regular board meeting for the St. Peter's School Board. It's Thursday, February 23rd, 2023 in the St. Peter Community Center Governor's Room um, on a snowy Thursday. Um, I saw something on social media today that Minnesota is the only place where people get really upset when storms aren't as bad as predicted. <laughs> so we are deeply sorry it wasn't a historic <laughs> event and that everyone is fine. We're so sorry. Yes. Um, but looking forward to getting back to school tomorrow. Um, so we'll call the meeting order. First thing we'll do is Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> A uh, reminder that if you would like to speak, please fill out a card and give it to Sarah. Uh, first thing up, consider and adopt the agenda. I make a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is adopted. We don't currently have any requests to speak. Uh, next, approval of the consent agenda items. Um, as is custom, we will not read all of the consent agenda items, but if anyone has any they'd like to comment on or pull out, we certainly can do that. But we do need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I just wanted to point out um, one item, and that is the grant from the St. Peter Good Neighbor Diversity Council in the amount of $11,580, uh, which is going to go through our community education program to develop some trainings and some classes and provide technology and um, some ESL classes, a whole list of things, and we thank them for their generous grant. Thank you to the Good Neighbor Council. That's awesome. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda is approved. And now the best part of the night, the student spotlight. Mr. Doherty, please introduce us. Oh, yes. Well, board Chair Potts, members of the board, I'm very excited to introduce you uh, tonight to North Elementary's uh, spotlight student from Mr. Noble's fourth grade classroom. This is Osri Alas. Alas. Um, very interesting with Osri. Osri actually has had multiple nominations from second grade to third grade to fourth grade. So I was really happy to see that uh, I know 110% she's earned this. I just love the fact that like, each one of her teachers, like all the way through North, like really recognized her, her work ethic, um, her ability to just make social like connections with her peers or classmates and stuff and really connect as a learner at North. So everybody wants to dial in and hear about Osri. <laughs> <laughs> calling for you. <laughs> so anyway, in true um, flex learning fashion, since Osri and I were gonna meet on Wednesday at North, that didn't happen. Um, so we went through Seesaw today to prep our presentation tonight. So I sent Osri a number of <coughs> questions um, that I'm gonna read out loud and then she, she got it ready and she's gonna read her answers to you so that you get to know her a little better. So, uh, so Osri, first question. Uh, what do you like most about yourself right now as a fourth grader? Probably like my reading skill and how I've grown over the years. Okay, so reading is a favorite topic mm -hmm. of yours. I did notice when I was looking at your report cards, you earned the top, pretty much the top grades all the way through second, third, and fourth grade. So I can see how that's uh, definitely something to be proud of about yourself right now. What do you think your future job may be? I'll probably start small and like fast food or something, but I would like to work my way to an actress. Oh, an actress. Yes. Okay, very good. Any favorite actress? actresses or actors right now? Um, no. None? <laughs> Just you. Okay. Um, what is the funniest thing you've ever done? Um, ages 
when I was like two or s two to six, I would pretend to faint and throw myself on the ground. Oh, that I thought that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, right? <laughs> uh, what do you like to what? Do you, how do you like to spend your time when you can choose what you want to do? Um, I usually play with my friends. We usually play outside, but since the snow, we've like been inside. Inside a little bit more, yep, with our multiple feet. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, will be different about the world when you're an adult? I, really, I haven't really thought about it, but um, I, hope, like, I hope they find more cures for like sicknesses and oh, stuff. That's a good one. Um, and then what do you think, besides reading, what are you really good at? Um, like my writing. My spelling mostly, and maybe like I'd try advanced English when I get older. Very nice, very nice. All right, now last year you placed fourth yeah. at the North Elementary Spelling Bee, and all everybody in front of her was a fourth grader. She was a third grader, and she was like right there with everybody else. Do you the do you remember the word you spelled wrong? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was transist transitor. Transistor? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good that's one. A tough one. And that's a perfect, you know, we have the North Spelling Bee coming up here at um, Arts and Academic Night on March 16th. So Osri and I thought it'd be kind of fun oh, no. to administer a little spelling bee to the school board. Yeah. All right? We just, we're, we have, oh, Mr. Dr. Potts, he's rubbing his hands. We got another spelling com competitor up there. So she has a list. She would like to be um, the MC for the spelling bee. So. Um, Sarah said everybody's got a pen and some paper to write on the oh. back of. We're only, she's only going to give you five words. Now this is the top, like top five misspelled words in English language. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> They're not that doing? uncommon. That's a lot of pressure. Are you, now, we, yeah, we're not going to put anybody on the spot. We'll, we'll let them self-correct, right, Osri? But, oh, phew. so the stress isn't going to be there. So, yep, you can take that test anxiety away. So, Osri, word number one. Separate. Perseverate? We want to say it again. Ooh, say it two times. Separate. Separate. Okay. <laughs> All right. Give him word number two. That's what you ask. Uh, say it. <laughs> yeah. We don't have time for that, <laughs> Mr. Cout. Calendar. Calendar. Okay. <laughs> Unnecessary. Oh. They're working hard up there. This one, this next one's my favorite. Questionnaire. <laughs> Accidentally. All right, I'll hand these out. See if you can stop <laughs> track. Are we working on it there? Oh my gosh. That was a chair. I think I got three wrong. Now, Mr. Grunseth, I, I want to remind you, last time we did yeah, some math I, problems, I think yeah, you may have gotten one wrong. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me about that. Is, is anyone going to go on in this, this year's uh, board spelling bee? You had to get them all right to place first in the spelling bee, right? Yeah. Oh, we'll study it for next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. So my observation is, is I thought I was really good at spelling, and I was the spelling bee champion, not to brag, but I was. Um, but I'm realizing how much I must rely on that autocorrect. Like, you get it close, and then you just go with it. So I appreciate it. That's good. Mm -hmm. no, Osri, that's good, because I used to run the spelling bee in the area, and you did a really good job being pronouncing yeah, Thank you. <laughs> All right, do you, do you want to introduce your family members? Yeah. So the one in the back right there is Zoe, my big sister. And then the baby in the car seat is Melina, which is my new niece. She's three months. And then that's Taylor, my mom's boyfriend. And then that's my mom and my brother, John, and my mom, Angela, and my sister, Esperanza, which is Spanish for hope. Very good. Very good. Thanks for being here. Any, any questions for Osri? Oh, Osri, I want to know what you read. <laughs> um, um, I've been reading Roald Dahl's book about the chocolate factory and stuff. Mm -hmm. Nice What do you like playing with your friends when there's snow out on the playground? Um, usually we make like a fort or something, maybe, or slide down the slide with the ice on it. 
fun. Osri, what's your favorite part about Mr. Noble's classroom? Um, how much patience he has. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. oh, wow. Did he prep you for that? Yeah. <laughs> what a good guy, right? <laughs> all right. And that's all we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We should just do a whole night of student spotlights. I think so. <laughs> All right, we will move on to action items. The first is the budget process continuation to identify adjustments for a balanced fiscal year 24 budget. Mr. Yes. Regner is here. Mr. Brown. We're, we're both here. Yeah. Um, during our study session, that wasn't just last week, was it? Maybe? No. Two weeks ago. Thank you. Um, we had some preliminary discussions about the budget. As you know, this is an ongoing process. We really have two seasons in the business office of the school district. The first half is audit and the second half is budget. And so uh, the most important piece is to do our um, enrollment projections for next year and to figure out um, our revenues for the coming year with estimated expenses and what we have presented at the study session was kind of that summary of both of those and Tim if you want to share about that sure um, I won't get into depth as we went over it pretty thoroughly I thought the other night but um, it's kind of a thousand foot view kind of starting on it to um, try and figure out where we where we are and where I kind of started was last year thought it um, if you know we we had, our expenses exceeded our revenues by about 1.4 1.5 million dollars in the I'm just basically talking about the unassigned funds and then try to make some adjustments for the things we know are going to change this year and next year. Um, you know, and that's what we kind of, I tried to outline in probably the first couple of pages of the handouts that you have that we kind of went over. Um, the third page in there, fourth page in, is kind of where a preliminary, you know, of the revised budget we're going to have. And we're probably going to show about the same type of deficit this year. Um, the one big, the factors this year that are really um, unique are from other years is the COVID funding that we get, which is one-time money. The deficit this year is probably worth about 1.5 to $2 million of COVID funds as we'll use up the last, the projection is to use up pretty much all of our COVID funds in FY23 or, or this year. There's a couple hundred thousand that'll probably carry over until 24 because the purposes are we um, we don't have enough expenses this year summer school expenses and there was a good deal of money for those type of expenses and so we'll have some funding for that in FY24 um, and then the the big thing we are working on um, as Mr. Grant said indicated is you know mainly the once we get the FY23 budget kind of done what's the big changes for 24 when we lose the COVID funding um, the big rocks for that are, are a lot of things the, the the government's working on now the the legislature the um, you know there's been a lot of talk so far about the education bill that governor Walz presented there's there's a lot of moving parts in there and what we did with the projection is we kind of took governor governor Walz's um, projection as what would get approved um, that's not probably going to happen in the whole but hopefully that's at least the base case the two or three really big items for us in fiscal year 24, um, you know, we probably have about, a, without, without the COVID funds, there's probably about a $3 million hole or a little bit better in the budget. A couple ways that that's going to be hopefully less is one compensatory revenue. We've talked about that uh, for at length. Um, this year and last year, it was a lot less because of there was, um, free lunches and the compensatory revenue is based upon people completing the the, compens the free and reduced applications so the last couple years they were way down this year there is not the free lunch so we had a lot more people fill them out 
plus they, they changed a little bit the qualifications um, for automatic. So we'll probably get about another $800,000 of funding in next year from compensatory. Um, it'll be a little bit higher than it was pre-COVID because we, we dropped definitely a lot of funds because of that. The other two big dollar items in the governor's proposal for us would be the um, change in the funding formula. Right now he's proposed for 24, 4%. Which would add, you know, probably six to seven hundred thousand dollars to our revenue for the year. And then the other thing that's fairly new is the cross subsidy in special education, which he's proposed fifty percent of the state making up fifty percent of that gap. Um, you know, and estimating on on twenty one figures, that's probably eight to nine hundred thousand for us. So those three items, you know, are a couple million dollars, which you know, and again, this is. A, you know pretty much an overview of things a pretty high level will help fill a lot of the shortfall but it will not fill it all um, you know and then we have some you know obviously increase in expenses um, for, for salaries and benefits and those type of things and then the other kind of the wild card is is inflation you know there's you know the utility bills and those type of things are are expensive um, have, have with the cost of one up and those uh, you know are kind of there yet too so those are the items we're looking at trying to, to fill. You know, right now we're probably looking at, you know, 1.1, 1 1.3, 1.5 million with those assumptions. Um, a couple big, probably wild cards for us yet are still, I don't have a total handle on our special education funding because uh, if you remember last year with the change at the Hoffman Learning Center, we had a lot more special education kids, and we get reimbursed for that. But that's a long pro that's a long process, and I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna get there. So hopefully, I've um, estimated conservatively on that amount, so we we could have a little bit more funding there. But like I said, there's there's nothing the inflation and some of the other items we're not 100% sure on yet either. So um, kind of a work in progress. Um, it will be a work in progress. The um, I, from the stuff I read, and I, I know Bill and some of the rest of you guys are, are more in tune probably what's happening at the Capitol, but it sounds like there's a flurry of activity going on this year. Um, you know, maybe it'll get settled before the end, but, you know, I guess I wouldn't count on anything being done probably before the end of May, I think, is usually when the session gets out. So we've probably got to make some decisions, at least start down the road before that, because, you know, we've made some assumptions there. Um, as far as what we're going to get in, and hopefully they'll come to fruition or a little bit better. Um, Thank you. I was just going to circle back a little bit on the special education that we do um, recoup about 60% of those expenses, yep. but it comes two years after uh, you've spent those dollars. So you have to carry the difference until, um, yep. until that change happens. So. As you know, our budget is due to the state by the end of June. Um, likely, we won't have answers from the legislature till May, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Right? Somebody knock on wood or something. Uh, we have seen those years where it's June or July, um, but hopefully things will be moving quite a, moving right along. Uh, we have seen bills going through both sides faster this year than we have in other years. So the other piece um, that is pretty time sensitive is working with our, with our own staff. And we know that as a district, about 80% of our budget is people, which leaves the other 20%, which is how we pay for gas and buy food and have the lights on and the heat on and buy supplies. Um, so there's, there are some changes that we can make with that 20% of the budget, but there's not, not a whole lot of movable pieces there. So that means um, we're talking about uh, positions and programs, and those are really difficult conversations. And we want to be respectful with uh, our timing on that process. So it is March now, and we are identifying our our deficit amount, our projected deficit amount. And we're not gonna know exactly um, what that amount is 
until May. And that's too late to make some of these decisions. So we need to plan as if that 1.3 to 1.5 million is what we are truly going to need to reduce. So what we are working on as an admin team is creating a list of possibilities. And right now, that's all it is, is a list of possibilities. We're working through every department and every line item to try to make the best decisions that we can for our students and for our programming that we can. Um, and we want to have this conversation with our teams and with our staff so that we're really transparent about where, we're, where we are standing financially and what may lie in the weeks and months ahead. So what we're asking um, the board to do is to help us along that journey by um, giving us a direction to continue to identify that list of possibilities that would come to you next month as realities of um, reductions to be made to our budget for next year. Did I miss anything, Tim? No, I, the only thing I'd add is, you know, we're, we're not alone in this process. Oh, um, yeah. There's a, you know, every time I get a lot of, I, I try to read a lot about other districts and things and where they're at and like MSBA puts out um, like clippings and sends and, you know, if you've read in the paper, Mankato's looking at significant, you know, Rochester, Wilmer, Faribault, I have, I've seen a number of them come through in the last two, three, four weeks. So, you know, hopefully that, you know, it's not a localized, it's, it's a statewide thing going on and so hopefully that's where I hope the legislature you know comes through with some decent fundings and can get it passed sooner than later so people know where they're at but I guess that's that's out of our control but it's not it's not just st. Peter and, and um, I think the last three pages on that that handout there was um, we went over that a little bit at the study session you know I put together some area and it's kind of the mm -hmm. you know fund balances and things like that and we're about right in the middle of a lot of the and there was nothing scientific about the schools I picked it was just kind of the, the local ones in our conference and and um, locally and, and some other schools that were about our size so you know we, we we fell almost smack dab in the middle of that so we have some fund balances you know that we used up last year and that we're going to use up this year so we, we came into it in a relatively stronger position than, than some schools there's obviously some that are are, are stronger than us but um, you know that, that's that's kind of where the where it's at I, I just want I wanted to build on that by saying we we do have a reserve and we have we have an appropriate amount for our reserve for our district our size with a district with a 30 million dollar a year budget and yes we could say we don't want to make any reductions and we're going to use our reserve but that puts us in a very vicarious financial position in the future where any given month, if I don't know, if something happens, a boiler goes or some item, we would, we would not have a way to address it. And so we need to keep this reserve uh, pretty close to the amount that it is for us to be uh, really financially stable into the future. So that's why we're recommending uh, making the reductions. Well, I'll just add to that that you know, this deficit and, and the need for these reductions is not is not one time. Right. So right. even if we used reserves, we're just putting ourselves in a more difficult position in a year, in six months, in eighteen months. Yeah. yeah. You know, this is a this is an adjustment that needs to be made to ensure long term viability. So so as these um, decisions are made and you explore all these options, like how does that mean, because it is people's livelihoods, right? And so how does that like, just kind of step me through a little bit, like how that would look like that information comes to us and it might not say a name, but it could say middle school social worker, totally making that up, okay. Everybody's gonna know who that is even if there isn't a name there. So like how do you, is that like, will those positions be addressed before the meeting? I mean, I would hate for it to be a, by note at a meeting kind of thing? Yeah. Even though we're hoping that we never actually would have to use that list, I think is the ultimate goal, but. And next week um, during the education committee and the business committee, we'll 
be having some conversations about um, more general things like class size, like number of sections. So not necessarily names, but you're right along along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, as things get closer and closer to being identified, um, we try to be really careful of, about that information and keep on the human side and have conversations before we think it might uh, become obvious what positions we're talking about. Uh, you know, I can still remember early, early on in my career, I, I knew what number I was on the seniority list and I knew how many positions that meant and you know anyone who's close to that line knows exactly where they are mm -hmm. so it doesn't i i realize it doesn't take much to to be there so i really try to be sensitive in these situations and have conversations ahead of time so that people aren't finding out um, by reading the paper or you know in a meeting so we will be talking about some higher level things in committee and then next month um, next month before it comes with names and lists we'll have had all of those conversations beforehand and then does our staff currently know kind of where we're at financially i mean are those things and i'm not asking a question because i want you to say the answer because bill and i don't really talk about what we do on professional <laughs> learning days so but i'm curious like is there I mean, is this going to be a surprise to people? Or is this going to be like, yeah, we've kind of been hearing about this? Well, that's part of the reason uh, it's, it's coming to the school board. Okay. You know, like tonight we're having these conversations. We have the study session with this information. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wrote an article yesterday for highlights that shares this information. Okay. So really um, getting it out there about where we are financially uh, the reasons we're here financially, the things that have caused it, and the things um, that lie ahead. So we really want to not have this be a surprise for anyone in the community. I guess I have a, a couple of things um, that I'd like to throw into the discussion. Uh, first of all, when the first articles came out about the huge surplus the state had, it was common thought that the aid to school districts would be improved 5%, 5%. Well, obviously, the governor's not doing that. And if Tim is correct and he's going to get his way, I mean, that's a big hit for us budget-wise. Secondly, in his bill, it was 100 and some pages. I don't know how many mandates are in there no. and whether or not they're all funded. But you've probably heard a lot about the paid sick leave mm -hmm. for no. everyone and the family leaves and all of that. And they're, right now my understanding is they're trying to split the cost of that kind of like TRA where the employees pay half and the employer pays half. Unfortunately, we don't have the capability to levy for that, mm -hmm. where the cities and counties can just unilaterally levy that. So we have to work that into our budget. And that, that's another big expense, and I don't know no. what other things. I haven't looked at that bill that closely yet. I believe there was an appropriation that went with that one. But whether or not it's sufficient to handle everybody. Right. And is it just for schools, or is it for all government? It was uh, schools, cities, counties. Yeah. And the same was true for um, um, unemployment. Yeah, unemployment. That, that's the other big one that, yeah. that could possibly come out of that. We but did do the math know, on that one. The cities and counties can levy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where. The unemployment, there was also, there was an appropriation for the unemployment one yeah. as well. But, and, and that's the thing to watch, is to yeah. make sure that the appropriation sticks to it if it does go through. Yeah. So I, so is 1.5 million enough? 
That's my question. When, when we uh, developed the, when Tim <laughs> uh, developed the, these, we, we really had conversations about being conservative. And so we try to really look at the expenses and look at those conservatively can, and make some um, judgment calls mm -hmm. on what we think those expenses are going to be. And then we try to be conservative on the revenue side as well. So our hope is that one point five would be enough. Um, we are hopeful that the revenues might come in a little ahead of what we're thinking. Um, and if we were to be a little short, I think at that point we could either make some additional uh, reductions or we could lean on the reserves if that number isn't huge uh, for the time being. But I think 1.5 is a, is a reasonable amount. I, I feel okay. Um, I feel hesitantly optimistic. Well, if 1.5 is a figure, hopefully you come in a little higher than that so we have a little wiggle room after everyone comes pleading. Oh, I, mm, I'm aware. <laughs> But I would, I would rather prepare for that 1.5, right? Um, and and at least be at that point. Just just a couple other thoughts. Um, I think it's really important that the public maybe not understand because I've been on the school board for 15 years and I'm not sure that I understand. But at least acknowledge that school funding is complicated and this isn't. 1.5 million dollars cut out of 30 million um, we get a lot of money that's very specific and mm -hmm. has to go to certain things um, we have a lot of fixed costs it's expensive to heat schools it's expensive to um, have lights we can't you know stop heating the buildings or stop turning on the lights um, those fixed costs are going up um, and we're a staff heavy business um, we should be that's where the majority of our money should go um, and so when we're talking about cuts like this and we're talking about positions and we're talking about real staff and people and families um, it's really difficult but it, there's no other way to do that there's no magic bullet it's it's not 1.5 out of 30 it's really 1.5 out of probably 15 or 10 of that and um, that makes the impacts to those impacted deeper. You know, one thing when you talk of school funding too, it's it's you know, as we talked, it's enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. And the other factor, you know, there's there's a few factors, but obviously one of the biggest ones for us is our enrollment has dropped the last couple of years. And that's you start at seven thousand or just short of seven thousand on the formula per kid, and then you add in all the other little bits and pieces it, it's it's significant money with the, the with the enrollment that has dropped and you have 12 years of two to five percent growth which is ideal exactly uh, like this district had yep you know and that's where we were able to you know save up some money so we you know hopefully could wither into it the last couple of years but uh you know with the enrollment drops that we've had and and um you know, our, our biggest classes are, are in the high school, as, we, as we've talked for many times, and they're graduating out, and that's, you know, you get the 1.2 in them, actually, you know, more a little more funding for the, the older kids. So that's, that's where the, the dollars really become significant. So. Tell me again, Tim, so you were saying that for the cross-subsidy for the underfunding of special education. I if, like that. Because yeah. <laughs> cross subsidy makes it sound complicated when yeah. it really isn't complicated. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> it's complicated. Well, it is complicated, <laughs> but anyways. Um, so you were saying if they, the government was proposing fifty percent, and then that was like eight hundred thousand for us. Is that what you thought or estimating? Obviously, this isn't right. Um, I think I had looked at our our numbers for two thousand twenty one. We're about eight. We're almost right at the state average. We're about eight hundred and fifty, give or take a little bit. 
you know, and then in round numbers, we had a couple thousand students. And I, I don't know if the proposal was, you know, adding that point two or just on there, but, you know, so it came out to about, you know, short of two million. And so I took half of that. And that's maybe a little conservative, um, but that that's a big dollar. You know, it's been a big dollar cost for years for us, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that goes way back to the 70s or, or whatever when the federal government mandated that and it's never been fully funded. You know, like Bill said, it's, you know, 60% or whatever we get and we get a few things here and there, but um, that's that's a big a big cost and it would be a big help to us if we got the 50%. Yeah. Um, and then for other people that are listening, there, and there's no reason or any of us that would feel that we're complaining about the expense, we're complaining no. about the reimbursement, obviously. Um, yeah. Different kids have different needs, and that's how yeah, that works. Absolutely. So then the other part was, and sorry, I'm like I hear things, and then it has to sink in, and then I ask my questions. Um, with the governor's proposal, were you saying it was four percent? His percent is four percent in uh, 24 next year, and then two percent the year after. You know, there had been a lot of talk. Um, I think Bill or somebody mentioned it at five and five, but but the uh, governor Walls came out with four and two. There are some bills up there at five and five. Um, you know, who knows what the legs are on, on those at all. You know, some tight inflation, some not. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but that, that's what he had proposed was the four and two. Okay. I just wanted to point out too, um, so with base student funding, that's more or less the amount that you get per student from the state. And when they're talking about 4% or 2%, they're talking about 4% of that $11,000. So it actually it'd be the, the seven thousand, you know, the, the base. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, the eleven thousand yeah. is the total. It's building. just short of seven now. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's when you get all the other categoricals in yeah. there, it gets up. Eleven. So it's four percent of seven thousand dollars. It's not four percent of right. thirty million. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where, you know, it's two hundred and eighty bucks a kid, you know, times our two thousand kids. So we're you know, or with the little extra, so it's yeah. six hundred thousand you know, in round numbers. And when he said the 850, the underfunding of special education, uh, so when we have that $7,000, the 850 is how much of that 7,000 goes into special right. education rather than into the base funding of the school district. So 850 per student. Yeah. So those are, those are, like I said, those are the bigger, there's a lot of, you know, there's hundreds of things in the bills and, and you could spend thousands of hours probably just reading them and I just tried to pick out the top ones that look like it. And then, you know, when it gets closer to there, they'll narrow it down. And there's other things in there for, you know, a little bit for ELL um, cross subsidy because we, we do have some significant, you know, not, not near what special ed, but we have some dollars there that we were underfunded on and then, um, I don't know. They're like, oh, the other thing that's going to happen—I mean, that that's really been in the news a lot. I shouldn't say it's going to happen, but sure appears that it's going to happen—is the free lunches. We've talked about that. Um, there was something came out the last couple of weeks. You know, big concern. I think Bill's the superintendent group has really been pushing for it is to make sure that if they do do free lunches, they have a way to replace the mechanism for compensatory and all the other titles that are are funded with that. Because, you know, we we probably lost seven eight hundred thousand over the last two years in compensatory funding because of the drop in free and re because we had free lunches you know our food sir our food service balance looks great um yeah. but we can't use that for for anything besides food service or food um but that that's something that's came out and that 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 looks like it's going to happen i guess as much as anything i will say it would be better for us financially to get 50 percent of the cross subsidy covered than to have the extra one percent. Yeah, because it's it's a much bigger number. Is yeah. there anything in that um, school lunch bill that would address uh, previous debt and how we could get that? No, I have no. Um, I I did ask about that from the state finance director, and we can't retroactively uh, provide funding. So they well, can't. they could allow us to you, use, use some of the fund balance. Right. We can use general fund, but use right. the food service surplus. Yeah. They would have to be identified as um, being eligible for free and reduced price lunch to get that funding. The 
probably I, I'm not sure if the state could necessarily do that because the, the food service program is a lot more federal. federal. Okay. Um, just flows through the state. Just flows through them. So I mean that would that would be hard to use that funding probably. I, you know I'm not sure the mechanics. Totally, they're paying. But, they're paying the difference with state funding though. Right. But they make the laws. They could change it. Sounds easy to me. <laughs> So this is an action item that would require a motion to essentially give you all the charge to move forward with identifying um, adjustments and reductions. So I'll make the motion is made. Second. Second. Any further discussion? If not, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes uh, to give, uh, to work on the budget process continuation to identify adjustments for a balanced fiscal year 24 budget. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. This is hard work, Tim. Thank you. Uh, action item two, consider policies with MSBA revisions or annual review requirements for approval with a single reading. We just have so much fun in the policy committee. I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe that wasn't totally sincere. Uh, but these are um, all policies that require an annual review. So we did go through them uh, in the policy committee. There weren't any significant changes. I think there were maybe a word or two here or there. Um, and that, that means that we've done all of our transitions, we've done our annual reviews, and now we can start all over again. Very exciting. Motion to approve uh, the policies with MSBA revisions um, or annual review requirements um, as listed in the packet. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify, oh, sorry, discussion. I have a question. Yeah. The one about family policy. That's practically all statute, right? Mm -hmm. So, do we really need a policy? Can't we just have a policy that says we'll follow the law? This one, <laughs> this one's actually a required policy, and. Um, but I mean, so for like in the purpose, it says purposes policy is to provide for family medical leave to school district employees in accordance with Family Medical Leave Act and also with parenting leave under state law. Can't we just leave it at that and forget all the rest? And the reason I, I say that is when you start quoting statute in policy. Oh, I know. When they change the yeah, statute, you change it. Right. Yeah. You're, it's like you don't want to put statute in contracts because if the statute's revoked or something, you're stuck with it in the contract. I would think the same philosophy should follow policy. And I don't know. Maybe I, that's something you have to go to MSBA and see if that suffices as the required policy. But I, I wish I had my policy binder sitting next to me <laughs> yeah. so I could um, refer to it. But I believe this is one of the policies that's required in the statute for us to have a policy about it and for us to review it annually. But I would need to look that up. Well, I mean, and we can. If I we mean, just, if you'd like to pull it, yeah, we certainly can if and we bring just, it back. I mean, if we just did. The first Roman numeral one, the purpose. It seems to me that we could pull that and we could ask MSBA if that would be sufficient. I understand what you're saying about the redundancy or the need to change the whole thing if something changes. So we can check with MSBA and take a chance or take a look at the policy itself and is, make a decision. Is the statute current in our policy? Like, everything is current with this update. It's not out of step. It does describe the whole statute, but that statute is currently enforced as written in our policy. Right. Um, 
And if there was an update, it would be updated by MSBA and sent to us for a change. But I mean, we could we could update we could update more than once a year if the statute changes, right? For sure. You all could catch it next year and then make that decision. I just I think it's a great point. Yeah. I yeah. just but if we have the updated policy in you know, updated and approved, then we're good. But right I, now. I think it might be worth asking the question of MSBA because I can't I won't be able to pull an example out of my head here. Mm -hmm. That can't be the only policy where we say we refer to a federal law or almost all of them do. Right, but I mean where we don't then outline in some right. way um, the actual thing. Yeah. yeah. Because then a lot of our policy would, would just say refer to something else. We're going to follow right. this. So, I mean, if, if MSBA says you don't need the redundancy, it might be well, worth them know. looking at a lot of our other policies that have it. Yeah. This can't be the only one that has. Well, no, there's you know, <laughs> right. Yeah, now that you bring that up, Charlie, I think maybe that is the case. Like, I'm sure the weapons policy, mm -hmm. right, is that along those lines? Yeah, right. Bullying policy, yeah. Yeah. harassment. And the, the, discipline. the policies are intended more as instructional or, or informational. Right. Or right. The district and so on, rather than just brevity. Right. Right, and that's the part I worry about is. Mm -hmm. Then it wouldn't be if good. every policy just said look somewhere else for what our policy right. is right. it doesn't help as an instructional reference, reference. Yeah. I feel better we about it that we statutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's short <laughs> policy manual that we do have MSBA that we pay for their services then and they would tell us you know what I mean so it's not like we have to be like oh no that oh, no. Look for the book. <laughs> right right <laughs> well that's kind of what it's <laughs> kind of what we were doing I know yeah. and um, not always effectively maybe but but because of our relationship with MSBA and the services that we pay for from them, uh, after the legislative session, their attorneys uh, apply the new changes to policies, and then they send them to us, um, which, which comes to the policy committee. And this version of our policy closely mirrors the MSBA model policy Yes. Yes. for family medical leave. So for the moment, I think it would be it would be safe for us to leave this as we have to approve them now. It's MSBA is not going to come back with an answer on this no. or any of the others in a very big hurry. So we'll, we're covered by the policy as we're being asked to approve them tonight, and then as the annual review comes up, that question could have been addressed. Yeah, I'm sure Carrie will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, though. It's always fun to talk to Terry. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion? We had a motion and we had a second. All those in favor of approving these policies as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We approve these policies with MSB revisions or annual review requirements. Thank you. <coughs> That's all the action items. Uh, next up, informational items. The first is social emotional learning curriculum pilot. And Ms. Sakura is here to talk to us. Yes, hello. Ms. Sakura, who's missing a birthday party. Yeah, Aww. it's OK. We knew it was coming, so. All right, um, so I've been working with uh, counselors and social workers on looking at social emotional learning curriculum. And this really started with our strategic planning, um, but even before then, really just as a former counselor myself, um, experiencing the long-term impacts of COVID on mental health and youth, and also just the uh, necessary support that families were asking for. So um, as a result of the long-term impacts of COVID and youth mental health, that became part of our strategic plan to really look at social emotional learning in our schools and what we were doing. So we got a large group of folks together this summer and did a big brainstorm of all of the different supports and programs and groups and things that they were doing. And um, really pre-K through 12, we had a lot of different things happening, really good things. Um, but as we talked in a group, um, they weren't all aligned and every school was doing something unique and different. 
And that was a little bit of a challenge for students to navigate and for families to navigate going from school to school or in, in different programs. So our goal really became to develop something or, or find something that was going to be aligned pre-K through 12 so that students were hearing the same language ongoing, um, so that teachers had an ongoing process that they could follow, something that was turnkey and easy for them, didn't feel like another prep, um, something that didn't feel too far out of their comfort zones. And so we um, utilized CASEL, which is a network of professionals um, across, I mean, it's a nationwide program, um, and they have a guidebook on how to really look at this as a school district or as a program. So we started there this summer, and they have several different um, recommended curriculum, like hundreds, and so we divided into smaller teams at each school level. So we had student support, some teachers, principals were involved at every level as well to look at different programs. And uh, we met in late January and brought kind of the, the programs that everybody liked and Empower You was one that came forward and Character Strong was the other one. And so in diving into those two, it was determined that we wanted to look more at Character Strong. Um, they have a pre-K through 12 program and so now at this point all of the schools have done kind of a, an intro with Character Strong to get information about the program. Um, just some things that we liked about it, um, it was very, it is very turnkey. Um, they have a scope and sequence and I put in the board book, uh, it's a two page like PDF with different links so if you want to explore more. Um, but it is aligned to the CASEL framework that's suggested. It's also aligned to the ASCA standards, which is the American School Counseling Association. So, um, so both of those are, are really fully endorsed, character strong. Um, it's all embedded in a website. So teachers just go in and they click on the lesson that they need and everything is there. Um, there's videos, there's songs at the pre-K uh, four level. There's, there's just a lot there. There's also newsletters that can go home because that was one of the priorities that we discussed as a group was really engaging families and the community as well in this process. So there's a lot of different things that really pull this together. Um, the intention is that this program is a tier one, so really for all students, really normalizing that social and emotional well-being for students um, and really just making that part of our school culture and part of our school learning. So again, we like that it was pre-K-12, we like that it, there was just really easy to implement lessons. Um, they also have, a, they call it the gym, and there's extra resources and, and supplemental lessons that are also tied to content. So if you're a social studies teacher and you wanna pull in some SEL, you can go at high school, social studies, and then look at some different ways to tie things in that way. Um, they also have a tier two curriculum. So there's some assessment built into the tier one component if you wanted to do that as part of your tier one program that would then identify like this group of kids needs additional support in emotional regulation or this student, this group of students need additional support in this area. And then they have curriculum that, that dives deeper tier two into that. So that's just another level. Um, they liked the pre-made newsletters um, for families. Um, and this is also another one that, or one that was unique because it had different scope and sequence for every grade. A lot of them are more by age group or level, and so then you run the risk of repeating something from second grade to third grade. And while the themes certainly continue throughout, there are unique lessons for every grade. So that was another really positive piece. So at this point, um, and why I'm sharing this with you all, is I just I want you to know what we're doing. It's really, really cool stuff. Um, but we're at this point just moving forward with a pilot at all of the levels. So um, right now the this, this counselors and the social workers have access to this, but we're working on getting demo accounts for teachers so they can start using this with some students and getting some feedback from, from them and their kids. So it's kind of where we're at um, and I'd love to answer some questions about the program. I don't know how much you've been able to click around in it, but there's some samples and things like that. Yeah, so you've shared, uh, and this is very important, so thank you. Yeah. Um, hundreds of curriculum to choose from, right? That's a lot of navigating that. I'm guessing there was oftentimes um, uh, bleed over or multiple coverage from various mm -hmm. curriculum, right? And 
we've heard all the th many things that you like about this. Is there anything in this program that you wish it also had because something else had it? Honestly, not really. Um, we haven't come across anything so far that seems to be a gaping hole. I know that there are some schools in the area that use this that have spoken really highly of it. So that was one reason that this particular one rose to the top. And I think Darren and Doreen, you maybe saw something at a conference about this too, Laura said. We spoke to a few people. Yeah. So th that's one reason this one rose to the top. Um, it was also pretty affordable. Some of them, many of the curriculum, it's a every year uh, cost. This does have a little bit higher initial cost, but after that, the costs really fall off. So many of them are, I mean, $20,000 a year every year that you're using it. Um, this has an upfront cost of like between 15 and 16,000, but after that, it's like 5,000 or less if you're sticking with the tier one. So that was one reason this this really seemed to stand out. There wasn't any gaping holes, yeah. and it seemed to be affordable as well in comparison to some. So with a, with a pilot, mm -hmm. right, you're gonna do some assessment and get feedback and all that. Like what does success look like? Like what, what is gonna make you say we need to do this? I think a lot of it's gonna come down to teacher feedback and how feasible it feels. I know at the high school they're planning to implement during Saints time, they have that dedicated 20 minutes a week. At the middle school they have that advisory piece. Um, at the elementary, it's gonna look different because they don't have that necessarily dedicated time, so it'll really be kind of for teachers to play around with. Um, at that pre-K five level, they have, you can, they have weekly themes and you can grab like a five minute lesson, a 15 minute lesson, or a 30 minute lesson. So it'll be just the teachers kind of playing around and I think the feedback that we're looking for is that it seems like something that they can utilize and that they will utilize. We don't want to spend money on something that is difficult to implement and, and doesn't result in that buy-in from teachers. During the education committee, you had shared about when you that the, one of the things that some of the teachers were worried about is finding a curriculum that would work for pre-K through 12, and I thought it was interesting. And yeah. I don't know, I don't think she shared that part tonight about that. Really, when it came down to it, they actually you guys all did kind of land on the same page. Is that yeah. Right? Well, like I said, they when we came together and I, I said, everyone bring your favorites. It was this one and Empower You, and it was pre-K. It was the elementary level and the high school level that both came with Character Strong. And because they, you know, on the opposite ends of the spectrum there, both came with it, then the middle school said, well, we better look at that one. We hadn't looked at that. And when they looked at that one, it seemed like, you know, they were more on board with this than the Empower You that they had originally thought, so. And also at the Education Committee, I thought it was, the, one of the concerns is always, how much burden is this gonna put on the teachers? And the yeah. fact that they can, they can, they have something, you know, user friendly mm -hmm. and can implement and the continuity of it. So right. the kids are getting the same kind mm -hmm. of, of a process. So yeah. that was very impressive. Yeah. yeah. So our plan is to keep moving forward with this, uh, mm -hmm. kind of doing this pilot, getting a little bit more feedback. Uh, but you may see this in the near future as uh, um, a purchase request, mm -hmm. depending on that feedback. Yep. And this wasn't our strategic plan, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. It yep. was, and it, it, it's really under that safe and welcoming environment, but it sort of falls into that multi-tiered systems of support category as well, um, because this would, this would definitely support that process of having some interventions available. And just coming off the budget conversation. I know. Into this yeah. I know. The timing. <laughs> I know. This, it's like this falls within our capital budget, um, so that's capital budget is separate from classroom budget and so we do have uh, a line item in our budget every year for capital purchases that builds up over time to allow us to to buy this and to pay for ongoing things like software licenses yeah. anything else all right thank you right. thank you go join that birthday party now yeah no. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next informational item, first reading a revision to the policy manual. There are a couple policies here, uh, 613 graduation requirements and policy.
policy 620, credit for learning. Both of these policy revisions are related to a change in local course requirements. Yes, um, Principal Ingeldinger, if you want to come up too and help if I uh, miss anything on these. The, both the education committees and the policy committees uh, discussed these uh, policy changes. Part of it has been a long time discussion and part of it has been um, an adjustment because of the change. Uh, it is a change in the graduation requirements. Looking at ninth grade communication is part of it, which is also lovingly known as speech class. Well, maybe not so lovingly. <laughs> <laughs> but those, the standards that were addressed in that class have been distributed into other areas of the curriculum, into other courses, and so we don't really need that ninth grade class anymore. And so this recommendation was to, um, to do away with that half credit. It's also part of a larger conversation we've had about increasing opportunities for students to take elective courses and to more choose their own adventure um, in school, reducing local requirements as we're increasing um, opportunities for students. But uh, this change created the need for another change, and I'm going to ask Mrs. Ingeldinger to explain that because <clears throat> I always seem to get the quarter credit wrong. Yeah, it's, it's kind of clear as mud, um, unless you're working within that, that high school schedule a lot. Um, so so there are, there's a .5 state requirement that our ninth graders have in social, it's 3.5 um, requirements for social studies. So with that .5 credit, we have to have something else to match up against that, um, whether it's a, whether it's a semester skinny or a semester block, um, it's a quarter. It's a quarter long class. Um, so that being said, we had to find something else that would match up against that. Um, everything else is either a full credit course uh, or a state requirement. Um, so our ninth graders have currently have a full semester of FIED, and so this will drop that to a point five, and that'll go against. Um, against that 0.5 social studies class that our ninth graders have, giving them one more elective opportunity for choice. So the 0.5 FIAD credit and the 0.5 communications class, um, if they both go, it creates an opportunity for the ninth graders Correct. to take an elective. Correct. <coughs> and that's what both of these policies address um, because it is a change in the graduation requirement. It is still the same number, um, but it takes off the communications class and a half credit of FIAD and increases uh, one credit of elective. Yes, the, and, and we're not interested, at least at, in, from, my, from my office, not interested in, in decreasing the number of graduation requirements, just yes. changing them around to give kids more choice. So is there still a credit of FIAD required? Yes, we still have FIAD. At, we still have that 0.5 in ninth grade and in 10th grade. Okay. And this doesn't reduce staffing at all, right? No, it doesn't because, um, because the, the class sizes, there have to be as many sections of that ninth grade FIAD as we have social studies. So it will reduce their class sizes. There are elective classes. Yes, correct. In full disclosure, are there elective FIAD classes at the ninth grade level? Not currently, no. Not currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just, you know, want to point that out. Yep. Um, I've talked, this is one thing that I've talked a lot mm -hmm. with my husband about. <laughs> um, and I so, I would imagine so. Oh, it's been interesting. And I'm just going to say some things and then you can, but I just, so that people understand we're not just all sitting here like this isn't a big deal because this has been a big deal. Um, and I think it's just, it's, there's going to be other, because right now, even when my son brought home the ninth grade registration sheet, because they have like more electives to choose from right now in ninth mm -hmm. grade than they do in 10th grade. So it kind of looks like we don't know what we're doing, but really we're just in the process of change, right? Mm -hmm. And so there'll be more of these discussions that'll happen. Um, we were not picking on FIED in particular, and we do understand. 
<laughs> or English or any of them. Um, and what I really think is interesting is there's corporate restructures all the time. People get moved around. But with teachers, they're very, very passionate. But that's what makes them awesome, awesome teachers. I would almost be more concerned if they were like, all right, whatever. Right. I mean, honestly. And so it is. It's really hard. And there is a lot of passion there. Um, and I think we recognize the importance of phi ed and English and all those things. But just that there has been a lot of discussion about it, I think is what I'm trying to say. For mm -hmm. people that are like tuning in, they're like, well, they just kind of th just shove that right through when that really hasn't been the case. So. So, Annette, does this, when it's in red, does that mean you've added it? Yes. Okay. So the, cro the crossed out is old language, the red is new language. Okay. Thank so. you for answering that. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a half a credit of help at one time? Yes, it, there still is at the sophomore year. Okay. I just see that's yep. in red, that's why I'm wondering. I originally thought it was meant that it was It almost would be helpful. That should not be read. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next time if we talk about something like that to have like that chart. You know what I mean? I think that's very helpful. Yeah. Because looking at this it, it yeah, is very the chart I mean this is the easier. policy that we're approving, so that's important, yeah. but I think looking at that bigger picture is like, okay. So. We can bring that for the second reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I imagine there will be a lot of questions about that, especially because there's more elective credits for ninth grade than tenth grade right now. So, but that's just because that's where the change started. So, but I am very excited for our kids to be able to pick their own adventure, so to speak, to be able to maybe take a woodworking class that maybe they couldn't before, or whatever. And excited to see if the fire department or when they come up with more electives. I know that my son takes an elective fire class and loves it, mm -hmm. and there's kids that get great experiences from that. AKA curling. I mean, we would never have gone curling and I'm sure a lot of those other parents went to be there, so. I do wanna take this opportunity to say, harkens back to our other conversation about lots of requirements floating around in the legislature right now. And some of those are additional graduation credits, um, which would further burden us mm. and have cause us to do some restructuring of our own because with our <clears throat> local requirements, the new state requirements that they're talking about, there wouldn't be enough room in anybody's schedule. So we would have to make changes to get those new requirements in. But we'll be keeping an eye on that. I, yeah. I will also say our, our, the, our ability to continue to have that block schedule does give kids it already provides kids with more choice um, for electives than than most, so that's it's also a benefit to our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's all the informational items. Next up is reports, building principles. childhood. I'm just going to move this direction a little bit. So this is the time of the year, as I mentioned last time, where we start looking at fall and we start to hit it hard. Last week we had our school readiness open house and that was well attended and interestingly enough mostly by families of with three-year-olds. We have seen a dip in our three-year-olds. I think a few, in my own personal opinion, I think with the economy and paying for daycare and adding um, a preschool on top of that may have discouraged some folks from, from attending. But we saw a uh, Whoa. Some people were, were excited about that. It still is a lengthy application or registration process just because we do gather so much information both for the district side and 
side and for the program side. So we appreciate people's patience with that, but that has, I think it's going to be great. And so we have that available. We certainly are hoping families will contact us for that information. They can register through the district website. If anyone has questions, they can call our office. And then coming up here in March, we have our spring conferences. So we're looking forward to seeing our families and talking about those transitions for our kids who are in preschool now and heading to South with Mrs. Elke. So that's where preschool is at. All right, and I am happy to report that we survived another 100th day of school and Valentine's Day on the same day. Oh, so wow. I don't know if you ever um, need a little bit of energy, just stop by on one of those days. I don't know if it's the anticipation of candy that does it, but there is a high likelihood of weather. Um, also since the last time we met, we have finished our mid-year assessments. We use the fast screeners and throughout the district. And what was nice was last Friday was our second PD day. And this year is the first time that we've done that. And we really have gotten a great response from teachers who are saying like, you finally get a chance to go, okay, we're halfway through. What do we need to, you know, what is the data showing us? And then what changes do we need to make? And it's just a really good time to kind of come, come back and revisit what some of those goal areas are. Um, just to touch a little bit on what happened on those days each site planned their own activities um, but the paraprofessionals th that's another wonderful thing it's a day that we're able to provide them with some staff development oftentimes their day is the amount of time that the students are there and they get training prior to the start of the school year or they can get up to a half an hour every week um, but sometimes scheduling it just doesn't work for them to get that with their case managers. So um, it was really nice to have a dedicated day for, their, for them to get some of that PD. Um, some of the things that they participated in, um, and it was led by Julie Carl Bloom, and we appreciate her, her um, willingness to, to kind of take charge of the paras while the principals are working within their buildings. But the Office of Equity Education also pulled through for us in a big way. Um, Liliana and Maripsa both did a presentation on the Hispanic culture and allowed um, questions to be asked. And then Barack and Ayan did a Ramadan and really ex a presentation and explained um, what it is and why students, you know, are, are requesting prayer passes. And then there was some conversation in high school about so what would that look like so that um, you know that everyone is aware of what that process is. Um, we also had a presentation um, on the LGBTQ+, um, and it was done by Education Minnesota, and it was very, very well done. There were um, three teachers that were had gone through the public school system and are working within the system and identify in, the, in one of those groups and just shared their experiences in the school system. So it was very, very well received. Um, and then they came back in the afternoon and answered some questions. There was a second session. Um, we were supposed to have K-8 conferences this evening, but as you can see, we're all here. Um, we did move those and reschedule those for Tuesday night. And so if you haven't yet made your conference, <laughs> or scheduled your time, um, we did open the, the link back up so that parents can, we didn't just move everyone from tonight's schedule to Tuesdays, um, just because we know it's a different day and we may have different plans. So um, they'll want to go on and, and schedule those conferences. And then one last reminder that we will have um, kindergarten open house on March 9th. And it is at South from 5.30 to 7. And the kindergarten registration online is now available. Now I'm to Mr. Very good. Greetings from North Elementary School, where we would have had the kindness retreat today. Um, the kindness <laughs> retreat is an annual event for fourth grade. Youth Frontier, Youth Frontiers organizes it. Um, Bridget Mathowitz, who is now Schmidke, um, is the <laughs> department chair. Um, and she, uh, with Maddie Kennedy, um, do all the organizing here, um, which is a full day. Like it's, it's a full seven hours a day down at Johnson Hall with a ton of um, National Honor Society students that come down, facilitate uh, group discussions. That's gonna happen on April 6th, so it's, we were able to reschedule, and that's huge. Um, that's one of the things that we talk about at North. Um, we try to make sure that we're building in some experiences that last a lifetime, honestly. Um, you know, something that they can remember when they're 30, 40, 50 uh, years down the road um, when they have 
or Doreen's age. It's a long time. They always remember the pizza. That, that's that's a big deal. <laughs> Uh, let's see, also coming up uh, March, as I mentioned, when um, Osri is here, March 16th, Arts and Academic Night, and that's a big night at North. We have Science Fair um, projects on display. We have Interest Fair projects, um, performances, and visual arts as well as a spelling bee and pizza. So that's an all-night event, and hopefully um, the weather stays away from, uh, crazy weather stays away from that, that night because a lot of coordination goes into that as well. I love to read month is going on right now. Hope everybody's reading. Uh, lots of stuff going around, probably all the buildings, but uh, I'm gonna shout out to Karen Snay, who's our media specialist. She does a great job getting to all, all the buildings. Um, uh, she facilitates great curation of the books uh, in our media centers. And then she's just got activities going on all month long, whether it's reading bingo, reading around the world. Every um, classroom has like a huge world map on the outside of it for the whole month and they just fill in um, color in the countries where the authors are coming from, where the books that they're listening to and reading, which I think is pretty cool. That's new this year. Of course, favorite is always read my t-shirt day for dress up day. Get some interesting shirts on that day. Um, don't have to turn any inside out. Not doing that. I know, I did look at you on that one. Like, no shirts inside out on that day. That's good. Um, Doreen mentioned um, the great feedback we we're getting from our faculty and staff on the, on the professional learning day. The last one was on Friday. Um, North, we had a full four hour session from the Jeffers Foundation facilitated. Just out, we were outside for two hours of that afternoon and luckily the sun came out a little bit we went into the north the woods um, by north there um, they did a great job showcasing like how to uh, take a look at the new um, science standard on how it's phenomenon based uh, experiential um, and then not so much on the content but like just the process of getting kids outside um, outside the school and learning uh, on the move and uh, great feedback from them we're gonna look at doing a follow-up one in September in the fall. Um, and then uh, need to shine a little spotlight on uh, the, the third and fourth grade kindness crew. Um, brand new program this year, about 24 students. They applied in the spring. Um, you know, they're out and about. They have, they have cool special vests that they wear on the playground just to like work with kids and like, hey, you guys got a game going or just, uh, they're not out there to um, like, not similar, I forgot the program we used to have years ago where it was, uh, they would kind of resolve conflicts on the playground. It's not that so much, it's about like how do you, peacemakers, thank you. Um, it's not that so much, it's just about like promoting kindness and involving others. And so uh, you've probably heard a little bit about some kids how they sometimes experience like school anxiety, even getting into the building, especially after um, distance learning, uh, many of them. Some of them have, um, have really taken an active role of meeting some students that have some anxiety, like just getting off the bus, getting in the door. And it, it's like magic. Like as soon as they see those kindness crew kids like standing by the door, like, hey, welcome to school, let's get going. Like, like it's a 180 turnaround. So it's just another great way to showcase like kids, the power of peers, like it is just a great, a great way to um, change kids' whole perspective on school. So a little shout out to the kindness crew. They're doing a great job. Mr. Graff. That was a great update. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so last time I presented here, uh, we talked a little bit about History Day and how that uh, was really beefed up this year, a collaboration between our English and social studies departments. Happy to report we had 16 projects, uh, which is 25 students, I believe. Kate was uh, the last I heard uh, who will be moving on to Regions, and Regions will take place March 16th at MSU Mankato. And hopefully we have some... Uh, folks to report at the next meeting uh, that will be going on to state. Uh, last Thursday, we did a little experiment. We had what we called a parent event. Uh, we invited parents in, uh, and we presented on adolescent development. Uh, oh. And really what the idea was was just we wanted to get parents together to talk about adolescence and, and what's actually happening in the body and like the things you see at home that didn't used to happen, but now they do happen. Like There's a reason for that. Oh. Uh, so, uh, Lindsay Finch, our school psychologist, presented on adolescent development. Uh, Michelle Dozy and our uh, school social worker, Kylie Kuhlman, also presented. Uh, and then we had a parent panel. And the parent panel just talked about their experiences uh, with middle school students. Um, some of the parents, like their kids were out of the house. 
and they talked about how that went for them and some of the the parent panel had middle schoolers uh, currently in the building uh, so really cool experience uh, and we can we hope to continue to do that uh, and to invite more families in and, and really just some networking um, really the idea to to know that you're not doing it alone you know and I'm a, a middle school parent now so I rely heavily on, on others like holy cow that just happened was there a read my future portion no no we, we, we would advise against that at the adolescent level yeah uh the other updates uh upcoming uh really our time for our uh, performing arts programs at the middle school to shine uh, Bree Bergstrom and the 7th and 8th grade choirs are preparing for an all-city concert, which is a 712 concert, uh, and that will be on the 27th. And then uh, the middle school theater crew is putting on Lion King Jr. Um, those performances will be March 3rd and 4th, that Thursday, Friday. Prior to that, they'll be doing some dress rehearsals for our building for the 4th grade at North, and we're also inviting Spells uh, to come and join us for that. And then lastly, uh, Mr. Houck and the 7th and 8th grade bands have a concert on the 6th. Another great report, Mr. Mm -hmm. Graff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, coming at the high school, it's actually like one of my favorite events that we've started to have. It's FFA week. Uh, coming up not next week, but the following. Um, I know that the board members are always invited to attend. We have a, an excellent lunch um, served by and sort of cooked by our FFA club members. Um, I believe we have 22 outside businesses who are coming in for the career fair side of that. Uh, so that's, just, that's, growing, that's growing by leaps and bounds every single year. So thank you to our advisors and our kids. Um, the advisors are Gina Lilienthal and Mike Reeser. Um, and it's a, it's a big undertaking for them. It's like, it's like homecoming or snow week or something. They've got dress up days now and not a read your t-shirt dress up day. Uh, but, but it's a really fun week and I hope that, that you guys can make it. I'll send a reminder out about which day the lunch is gonna be. Um, board members, board members. <laughs> and, and superintendent. And I, and I guess the superintendent will invite him. Doesn't no, you're, of course you're all welcome to attend. Um, I always think about Bob Meeks when it's mock trial time. Our mock trial team is off to state again. So he would be very proud. Um, Ian Gershbauer is our Lions Club Student of the Month. The Lions Club still um, hosts that award for seniors. Uh, and at the end of the year, they typically give a, a scholarship to one or two of those kids too. So congratulations to Ian. Um, and one other discussion that's going on at the high school right now is our one-to-one -one device. Um, what the actual device is currently and since the beginning of our one-to-one -one, um, one program, we've had iPads at the high school. That conversation comes and goes whether or not iPads or Chromebooks are the, are the right choice. Um, so, so we're kind of in the middle of, of discussing that right now. Which is a cost savings. Which it would be a cost well savings. Oh, well <laughs> and Chromebooks have come a long way too, yeah. obviously. And they use um, them at the middle school. Yep, yep. And part of that discussion is that iPads being app-based can, at least they used to be able to, to do more creative work with an iPad. Now, like this is kind of a smaller version of an iPad and almost everybody has one. We could have a, for those, for those projects that we would need them, we'd still have carts available, but, um, but a lot of the work mm -hmm. that high school kids are doing is word processing mm -hmm. or um, internet based. So it, I, my sense is that we're moving that direction. Would that be for next year then or for their own? Well, we would have to phase in, yeah. So starting with, I believe Mr. Sorbo said that we had the potential of starting with nine and 10. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. I'm so lucky to get to work with that team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Just, uh, <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It is. You know, board board meetings are kind of an opportunity. You know, whether it's the informational items or the principal reports, to hear about the excitement there is for the work that we get to do every day, and you know, certainly uh, we have our challenges and our moments, but um, I, I think it's safe to say we all enjoy working with all the students and the staff, and um, it's just good to see everybody excited about the work that we're doing. So, um, I, I'm not sure why there's cold air blowing on us I right know, now. I know, but my nose is actually cold. I know. I, we've been having these conversations in the district office lately, too. We've, we've had some infrastructure issues. Uh, I, Tim Regner actually has the cold office. Um, he has the cold air blowing in, and all the heat gets reverted into my office. So it was like, I don't know, like 59 degrees in his office, and it was 110 in mine. So we just kept switching off throughout the day, and it was. Chocolate was melted on the table. And, <laughs> Tragedy. Yeah. Anyway, that was the bad part. But anyway, um, that's it. Another conversation for another meeting. Um, uh, obviously, we've just uh, had two flex days, and I just want to say I'd like to cancel my subscription to winter, if you don't <laughs> mind. Um, you know, it was kind of interesting because they've been. This has kind of been a, a big buildup mm -hmm. since last week and you know it's going to be historic and the biggest five storms in history and well certainly we got some snow and that's that's a Duluth term by the way we got some snow <laughs> it's more than we got a bit but less than it really came down yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we got some snow and we definitely would have had a flex day today anyway but to um, Chair Potts' comment, there were lots of people like, oh, sure, they call this historic. Yeah. Well, it was a lot of snow. So anyway, um, we have now had two snow days. We've had three flex days. Uh, according to the state, we have two flex days more that we can use because you're limited to five. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we have any more of these historic storms, we're, we're going to get close to having more conversations about what we need to do about it. But for now, we're okay. I don't think there's going to be that many more. Somebody once said, sometimes it snows in April. So, it does. That was Jerry Bob. was Prince. Moving on. Hometown <laughs> guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, moving on. Um, I, I wanted to add a little bit to our the conversation about SEL. Another avenue in, in, this, in the same highway is mental health and addressing mental health and providing resources to students and families and staff regarding mental health. And that's another conversation that we're having. Uh, we're looking into uh, an organization that provides some mental health services and mental health trainings through a grant um, by an individual family. And so we have, we have a meeting tomorrow to talk more about that, but we're hoping that along with developing the social emotional learning curriculum, we're also developing uh, resources for families to use when, when there are mental health questions or parents have questions about how do I talk to my student about this? Um, and how to address it. And so we're continuing in that work as well. And you will, you'll soon be hearing more about that as that develops as well. Um, I wanted to share <coughs> that I had an opportunity um, just the other day with Principal Ingeldinger to visit the high school and talking about staff being excited about programs and some of the same staff that you're talking about uh, when we went into Mrs. Lilienthal's class and a student brought us into the greenhouse to tell us all about everything that they're working on and there's full-grown tomatoes and she's saying would you like some cherry tomatoes we have some extras and um, just hearing about how excited they are and talking about how 
good the lettuce tastes and um, it was just exciting to see students engaged in such meaningful learning and to hear her plans for the future and how what she's doing and what she's learning right now apply to what she'd like to do um, her whole life and then we went into the wood shop and I was well really jealous of the size of the shop but um, they were building tables and there were different stages of building those tables and just seeing how independent and engaged uh, and really excited um, the students were about what they were working on and then Mr. Reeser came in with uh, all of these examples of their welding and explaining the process and I was really impressed with the products he was showing me and he says well this one's not so good but these two are excellent and, um, just hearing about the different certifications our students can get and the opportunities they have and uh, just really proud of the work that they are doing so with that I'll end my report thank you board members around the table two things one thank you or maybe a pre thank you to the facility and maintenance crew that are gonna have to move all the snow around in the parking yeah, lots yeah. Um, and the crazy parents that are driving in to remember that we have big snow banks to work around um, and then also and I nothing like thinking about things after the fact but with our fi head and I pointed out that there wasn't an elective credit for the ninth grade and I should say that that wasn't because the fire department didn't come forward with that it was more of a timing issue because I realized that maybe made it sound like they weren't doing their part but that wasn't the case and I just really needed that to be on the record <laughs> <laughs> understandable Got you. No, sir. well thank you around the table. Uh, we have some upcoming meetings. Education committee is on the 7th. Business committee meeting on the 8th. Study session has been moved from March 6th to March 13th. That will be at 6.30 p.m. in the media center at the middle school. And then the next regular board meeting is back to a Monday. Monday, March 20th. Yes. Good to get back to Monday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some, some board members are more excited than others. Thursdays January, are tough. January huh? and February are. Yeah. I like the. Yeah. It's nice to have some. Yeah, yes. consistency. Back to routine. Yes. Yeah. Routine. And the fourth Thursday really threw me off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. Is there a second? <laughs> I was like, nothing like pushing that along. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>